Frage. Du bist einen Monat lang durch Russland gereist. Welchen Eindruck hast du von dem Land? Schafft der Westen es mit seinen Wirtschaftssanktionen, Russland in die Knie zu zwingen? Hast du Auswirkungen der Sanktionen gesehen? Well, this was my first ever trip to Russia. Um, the last time I was in the region, um, it was called the Soviet Union. And oh. so that tells you that there's been um, a significant gap of time uh, between. Um, I've studied Russia and I've tried my best to keep um, up to speed on, you know, what's happening in Russia. But seeing it firsthand is always much different than um, than reading about it or listening to other people's um, opinions. Um, I, I can come away with a, a couple, um, I think, observations that would be of interest for a German audience. Um, first and foremost, um, the sanctions aren't working and they're never going to work. And it's an exercise in futility uh, and uh, believing that you can somehow sanction Russia into complying with um, European um, uh, demands regarding Russia's behavior in Ukraine or, or elsewhere. Um, the Russian economy isn't just surviving sanctions, it's thriving on sanctions. The Russian economy today is stronger than it has ever been. I'll just say that one more time so your German audience understands what I'm saying. The Russian economy today is stronger than it has ever been. It is healthier, far more resilient, um, and growing in ways that were unimaginable um, in the era prior to sanctions. Um, I think Germany, like NATO, like Europe, like the United States, has to reevaluate a couple things. One, their total failure to understand um, what imposing sanctions on Russia would mean, not only for Russia, but for Europe. Um, I think the German economy is headed into recession. And this recession is singularly caused by the policy of sanctions. It's the blowback. Um, Russia has, as I said, thrived. The sanctions have liberated Russia's economy. Um, you know, the, the West always believed that the integration of the Western economy with the Russian economy was a, was a plus for Russia, that this was uh, something sort of like a gift the West was giving to Russia. Here, you, you are honored to be part of our economic system. But I think what history is showing is that the integration of the Western economy with the Russian economy was a drag on the Russian economy, that rather than helping expand Russia's economic capability, the Western economic presence served as a leech, sucking Russian economic potential out of Russia into the West. Um, and by the West divorcing itself from Russia, um, the, this energy, this life's blood, economic lifeblood is being put back into Russia. Everywhere I traveled in Russia, uh, the economy was thriving. You know, here in the United States, uh, President Joe Biden has spoken of the need for an infrastructure development plan, build back better, he calls it. Um, well, it, it isn't theory in Russia, it's reality. Russia is building back better. Everywhere I went, there was construction, infrastructure development, improvements about everything, roads, buildings, um, you name it, Russia was doing it. Uh, why? Because one, the sanctions failed to isolate Russia from the world. The, I think Europe, Germany, NATO should understand that there is a whole big world out there that doesn't center around Europe. And that world is willing to work with Russia because they recognize the importance of Russia economically, geopolitically, um, diplomatically, militarily. And this, the, these nations are investing in Russia. Billions of dollars are pouring into Russia from overseas um, uh, companies. Companies are traveling, uh, you know, opening up business, et cetera. The Russian defense industry is booming. Um, 
It's working on all cylinders uh, that, that helps with employment, but it's also not impacting the civil sector. Sometimes, uh, you know, people have said, and, and I know Joe Biden talked about this, that when Russia transitions to its wartime economy to sustain the effort in Ukraine, that it will cause economic collapse. Far from it. The Russians have made this transition so that they are producing everything they need for the special military operation while continuing the civilian uh, economic expansion. So Russia's economy is healthy, vibrant, successful. Everything German's economy isn't. Um, so Germany might want to reconsider its, uh, its policies regarding sanctions. It's backfired and it's only isolating Germany. It's not isolating Russia. The other thing is um, the major takeaway is about the Russian people themselves. Um, for a long time, I think Germany, like the many Western nations, including the United States, uh, had been supporting the notion of helping create a vibrant political opposition to Vladimir Putin. Um, under the belief that the Russian people didn't want to be led by this man, that this autocrat was not attractive to the Russian people, and that if they could find somebody such as uh, Navalny, for instance, that they could uh, disrupt Putin's um, future, bring about a collapse of the Putin regime, and install this democratic leader. Um, I've always recognized that as being a fundamentally flawed uh, concept. But again, book reading is one thing, seeing it is another. Because of the special military operation, um, the population base, and, and remember Navalny never garnered more than two, three, four percent of the vote on a good day. Um, millions of people fled Russia after the special military operation. And um, almost to a person, they were Navalny supporters. And this didn't hurt Russia at all. It actually liberated Russia because it was like poison leaving the body. The people that remain in Russia aren't necessarily pro-Putin. They're pro-Russia. They believe in Russia. They support Russia. And these are people who may not have supported the special military operation when it first started. I think what I found is there was a lot of questions about why Russia had to do this. Um, and I think one of the reasons why those questions existed is that the Russian government hadn't done a good job of explaining the complexities of Ukraine, NATO expansion, et cetera, to the Russian people. So there were many people who uh, believed that the threat that the Russian government said existed in Ukraine uh, wasn't a threat worthy of Russia going to war. Um, but as the West, that's Germany, by the way, decided that they were going to pour billions of dollars of military assistance into Ukraine, transforming a Russian-Ukrainian squabble into an existential struggle for Russian survival against the collective West, uh, the, the finer points of why Russia got involved in Ukraine disappeared. And the only question today is how is Russia going to defeat the collective West, in, which has used Ukraine as a proxy to destroy Russia. And this is what the German people need to understand. When you endorse policies that seek to bring harm to the Russian people in hopes that that will somehow cause the government to collapse, all you're doing is causing the Russian people to rally around the Russian soul, the glue that holds the nation together. Um, I went to Volgograd. It's known probably better in Germany as Stalingrad. And the Germans understand what happened there. They understand that that was the beginning of the end of Nazi Germany's um, gambit to destroy the Soviet Union. When you climb the steps leading up to Mamayev Kurgan, the hills that were on the edge of the Volga River that were the Soviets defended against the Nazi Germany onslaught, holding the last hundred meters of the uh, eastern bank to prevent uh, the Germans from capturing uh, Volgograd, Stalingrad. 
Um, you climb this hill, there's 35,000 Soviets buried underneath that soil, men who died fighting Nazi Germany. At the top is a giant statue. The motherland calls. The emotion that comes from seeing that statue is unreal, unreal. There are some people that call it mythology. That basically it shows that the Russians are prisoners of their past. And in a way, the Russians are, because they will never forget their history. They will never forget what happened. The Russians literally believe that their ancestors are looking down on them and holding them to account for their behavior today. And does it honor the sacrifice that was made? In the West, we've forgotten about this. We forgot about this momentous uh, conflict, this titanic struggle. And the Germans have forgotten about it. This is where I get angry with the German people. Because while, yes, you don't want to wallow in um, history when it's negative. Um, look, I lived in Germany. I lived there in the 1970s. I lived there in the 1980s. I visited in the 1990s and the 2000s. And I love Germany. I love the German people. I love German culture. Um, and I have a respect for German history. But <laughs> you're going to say you respect history. You can't walk away from that, which is inconvenient. And yes, the period of Nazi rule is inconvenient. And Germany must never forget that it happened. and must never forget who it happened to. And 27 million Soviet deaths uh, will never be forgotten by the Russian people. Um, and that's what that visit showed, the, the statue of the mother calling the Russian nation forward to defend it resonates today. It's not just a symbol of what happened. It is something that every Russian recognizes today as they look at what's happening in Ukraine and the threat that the collective West poses to Russia's existential survival. It rings forth today with as much emotion and fervor and insistency as it did back in the day. And the image of the Russian mother trailing her dead son, which is juxtaposed there, resonates as well. I mean, Russians are dying in this war. There is a heavy sacrifice being paid by Russia. And for the Russians, the death of Ukrainians is equally painful. Because while the West is trying to paint this as a Russian aggression against the innocent Ukrainian nation, the Russian people recognize this struggle as a civil war among Slavic people that's been pushed on Russia by the West. There is no joy in the killing of Ukrainians on the part of the Russians. That mother holding the, the son, she's Russian. She's Ukrainian, she's Belarus, she's Armenian, she's Georgian, she's a Soviet mother. And that's what people need to understand is that while Russia today, we call it Russia, it's actually an ensemble of what, 150 different nationalities. Every city you go into Russia, you find Ukrainians, a significant Ukrainian population. If you rub a Russian, you get a Ukrainian. If you rub a Ukrainian, you get a Russian. They're the same people, and yet they're killing each other. And only the Russians are weeping about this. No one else is weeping about this. And Germany needs to understand that, that one day this war will end. Russia will not be defeated. And Germany's going to have to ask forgiveness again, because the German people have committed the gravest sin one can commit. You have sent German tanks to Ukrainian soil for the purpose of killing Russian soldiers. But what you don't understand is that the soldiers you think you're helping, you're murdering. I think the imagery of burning leopard tanks proves that it isn't a miracle weapon. It's just another piece of steel that Russia is going to destroy. And the men inside, well, let's reflect on this, the last story. I heard it while I was in Russia um, about Wagner fighting in Bakhmut. The uh, Wagner soldiers had surrounded a, a group of Ukrainian soldiers, heavy fighting. And they shouted out, brothers, surrender. We won't harm you. We'll take care of you. Surrender and you'll live. And you know what the Ukrainians shouted back? 
Russians don't surrender. Russians don't surrender. What does that mean? Yeah, they wear a Ukrainian uniform, but there's Russians. That's a slogan from the Second World War when the Nazis shouted out, surrender. And a young Soviet soldier shouted out, Russians don't surrender. And he died. These Ukrainians are Russians. That's Russians killing Russians. And this is why Germany will have to beg for forgiveness from the Russian people when this war is over, because Germany is responsible for this. NATO is responsible for this. The United States is responsible for this. But that's the lesson I got from there, Russian troops. Schauen wir auf den Ukraine-Krieg. Der ehemalige NATO-Generalsekretär Anders Rasmussen hat angeregt, NATO-Länder könnten in einer Koalition der Willigen Soldaten in die Ukraine entsenden. Hältst du das für eine realisierbare Option? Welche Folgen könnte das haben und würde es die NATO unmittelbar in einen Krieg mit Russland verwickeln? Well, it's, it's interesting when he says a coalition of the willing. Uh, what does that mean? Because NATO is a consensus-driven organization. That means that if one, and we see this with Swedish membership, all it takes is one member to say no. Or in the case of Turkey, hey, <laughs> we're not going to let Sweden in. Um, and we also see it, for instance, NATO wants to open up a liaison office in Japan. And France has said no. <clears throat> so what is Rasmussen proposing? Is he saying that he's going to go to that that they're going to go to NATO um, and ask NATO under it would be Article Four um, because uh, it would be NATO being the aggressor. <laughs> Article Five is self-defense <laughs> that would require Russia to actually attack. So what he's talking about is Article Four, which has been exposed as um, NATO's war of aggression um, because it's what NATO used, for instance, for regime change in Libya. It's what NATO used to justify attacking uh, Kosovo, attacking Serbia, or sending uh, nation-building troops to Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with defense of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It has everything to do with um, offensive, aggressive power. So this would be an Article 4 resolution, um, require unanimous uh, NATO approval. And you're not going to get that. Hungary is never going to go for it. Other nations will never go for it. Um, so. And Rasmussen's smart enough to know that, that he's not going to get an Article 4 protection. So it's curious, he said, the coalition of the willing implies that you are not going, that there's going to be unwilling partners. All right. So that means it's not going to be a NATO force. It can't be a NATO force because NATO can't act without the unanimous consent of the body. So it's going to be a European force. Um, which means they're going to enter Ukraine um, as combatants of what? Their individual nations? Rasmussen's smart enough to know, for instance, when Turkey entered Syria on its own volition, it didn't do so as a NATO nation. It did so as Turkey. As a result, when Turkish troops were attacked by Russian aircraft, and suffered casualties, and Turkey went, oh, ouch, NATO, help us. NATO was like, it's not our business, man. You, you did this on your own. So understand that whatever coalition of the willing that gets dispatched, if it does get dispatched to Ukraine, um, when the time comes for it to close with and destroy the Russian enemy through firepower and maneuver, um, and it gets slapped back, uh, NATO can't protect. It's not a NATO force. Um, and NATO puts itself at risk if it seeks to protect, because then NATO now oh. has done something to become a party to the conflict, and there can be consequences to that. Um, so now, let's say Rasmussen knows that, that the, whatever force he sends is going to be on its own, on its own. Coalition of the willing. Sounds good. After all, didn't we use a coalition, coalition willing to take down Saddam Hussein in Iraq? Um, so, you know, he's, he's doing that. But Rasmussen needs to reflect on maybe the words of the current commander of Allied forces uh, and the head of uh, U.S. forces in Europe, uh, Christopher Woolley. He spoke in a defense forum in Sweden last January. 
He said, the scope and scale of the violence that's taking place in Ukraine today is beyond the imagination of NATO. That means it's beyond the imagination of Rasmussen, who somehow thinks that what? I mean, is this going to be um, a bloodless conflict? That the mere fact that these Western boots on Ukrainian soil are going to intimidate these sheepish Russians into turning and running? Um, that you may suffer one dead, two dead, a handful of casualties. Um, what happens, Mr. Rasmussen, when the force you send in suffers 10,000 dead the first day? Because it will. Because the scope and scale of the violence taking place in Ukraine is beyond the imagination of NATO. You have no clue what's about to happen to you, Mr. Rasmussen, or your force. They will be slaughtered. Every aircraft you send in to support, first of all, what aircraft are you going to send in? Because if an aircraft takes off from Poland to support combat operations in Ukraine, that Polish airfield becomes a party to the conflict and Russia will strike it. So are you going to push the Polish Air Force onto Ukrainian soil where it will be eviscerated by uh, the Russians as well? Uh, the, as these troops move forward, their logistics are going to be hit. They're going to run out of gas. Tanks without gas are death traps. But in this case, tanks with gas are death traps because what army is he going to put in? An army that hasn't imagined this violence. When was the last time any army in NATO besides the American army has practiced brigade, multi-brigade sized uh, combined arms uh, operations against a near peer level force? NATO has not been preparing for large scale ground combat in Europe. Um, they don't know how to fight it. They literally don't know what they're doing. They're incapable of doing this. So whatever force you bring together is not trained properly to do this kind of combined arms offensive operation. They don't have the equipment for it. They don't have the sustainability for it. They don't have the personnel trained in it. It is literally an invitation to slaughter, and that's what will happen to this coalition of the willing. Every single soldier that steps foot on Ukrainian soldier a soil and seek combat with the Russian army will either be killed wounded, taken prisoner, or sent running home. There is no other outcome. Rasmussen's a fool, and anybody who listens to him is a fool. This is a fool's errand. It isn't going to happen. It can't happen. And I certainly hope that when NATO gathers in Vilnius uh, next month, that nobody tables this ridiculous, childish idea. Die NATO will auf ihrem Gipfeltreffen in Vilnius über konkrete Sicherheitsgarantien für die Ukraine verhandeln. Dessen Präsident Volodymyr Zelensky macht medial Druck auf feste Zusag für eine Aufnahme der Ukraine in die NATO. Plant die NATO wirklich die Ukraine und auch Moldawien aufzunehmen oder ist das nur ein Bluff? Look, the problem is that NATO is a prisoner of its own rhetoric. And um, if you remember in the lead up to this conflict um, back in uh, 2021, um, Russia was saying we, we need Ukraine to commit to permanent neutrality. And um, everybody said, well, you know, the, uh, the door to NATO is always open. Anybody who wants to become a member. <clears throat> and so NATO will not, at this juncture, backtrack from that. Um, so NATO will always maintain the pretense, the potential of Ukrainian membership. But the reality is um, Ukraine cannot enter NATO while it's in conflict. It's a violation of NATO uh, policies, et cetera. There, there can be no ongoing territorial disputes because um, the fact of the matter is the moment you allow Ukraine to enter NATO uh, while it's in conflict, NATO is at war. And a war between NATO and Russia is a nuclear war and NATO will kill itself. So, This, nobody's seriously considering this, and it will not be considered. Uh, Ukraine will not be offered membership, uh, and security guarantees cannot be offered to Ukraine until this conflict is over. That's just a statement of fact, because you can't guarantee that which you can't guarantee. And uh, you know, providing a security guarantee to Ukraine is, is, is a meaningless concept unless you're willing to back it up with force, and nobody's willing or able to back it up with force at this time. So Ukraine will be left to rot on the vine, which is what's happening today. You basically, NATO is allowing Ukraine to die. Um, you know, the, the, the interesting thing of um, people in NATO now, you, you hear people talk about, well, we need a negotiated settlement. Uh, we need uh, this. We need that. Um, 
why weren't they willing to have a negotiated settlement uh, back in December of 2021? Why weren't they willing to have a negotiated settlement when Minsk was still a possibility? Why didn't the French and Germans, by the way, Germans, why weren't they serious about Minsk? Why did Angela Merkel lie to the Russians and uh, lead them to believe that uh, Germany was serious about negotiations, uh, that Minsk was a possibility? Because had Germany at that time supported Minsk, Ukraine today would be intact. Intact. Imagine that. 300 plus thousand Ukrainian soldiers would be alive. Tens of millions of Ukrainians displaced from their homes would be in their homes, thriving, living. There wouldn't be a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure damage. There wouldn't be the greatest ecological disaster that's befallen the Black Sea having occurred. None of this would happen had Germany been serious about negotiations. Germany was in the driver's seat back then. You know what Angela Merkel did to Germany? Exposed Germany as a nation of liars. A nation of liars. How can NATO speak of negotiations with Russia when their track record with negotiations is one of deceit, deception, lies? Um, the other thing is, if you're going to sit down and negotiate, you actually have to have something on the table. What does NATO bring to the table? Nothing. You see, Russia is going to win this war. Regardless of what NATO does, there's nothing NATO can do to prevent this war. Germany doesn't have enough tanks to be destroyed in Ukraine to change this. I heard the German chancellor talk about, well, we're going to send hundreds or more Leopard tanks. Are the Russians scared? No, not at all. F-16 fighters, send them. They'll be shot down. Any missiles you send, they won't work. This war is over, except for the dying because Russia will win this war. Russia is unified. Russia is strong. Russia is resilient. Russia is healthy. NATO is sick. Germany is sick. France is sick. Europe is sick. It's not healthy. Your economies aren't healthy. You're not thriving. Um, and yet you continue to do this death dance where you send Ukrainian men to die for your, what, sick belief in some sort of uh, European dominance over Russia. It's disgusting. Uh, it's not going to work. All that Europe is doing right now is guaranteeing that when this war ends, and it will end, there will not be a Ukrainian state. That's the sad truth. The longer this war continues, the more guaranteed it is that when it's finished, Ukraine will not exist as a nation state. And that's on Germany. That's Germany's fault. This war could have ended at any juncture could have been prevented had Germany embraced Minsk, then you would have had the totality of Ukraine intact. It could have ended had Germany encouraged um, Zelensky to sit down in Istanbul on April 1st of 2022 and sign the peace treaty Russia was ready to sign. That would have um, kept most of Ukraine intact. Donbass would have been independent at that point in time. Crimea would have been removed, but that's better than the current situation. It could end today if Germany would accept the fact that Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Lugansk are forever Russia, along with Crimea, that that will never change. It could end today if you accepted that, but they won't. And so now what you have is the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, saying that the Ukrainian state is over. We shouldn't be talking about the existence of a Ukrainian state. You have Russian politicians saying, if we sit down at the table, um, Ukraine is going to have to start off by giving us Odessa, Mikhailov, Kharkov, giving us, because we're not going to end without at least that. So Ukraine is doomed at a minimum to lose another 20% of its, uh, of its uh, territory. But if it continues to resist at the behest of the West, it will lose 100% of its territory. Die ukrainische Offensive ist angelaufen, aber noch scheint die Front zwischen der Ukraine und Russland stabil zu stehen. Ukrainischen Streitkräften gelingen zwar kleinere taktische Durchbrüche in die sogenannte Graue Zone, doch der Blutzoll für Kiews Truppen ist enorm. Was sind deiner Meinung nach die Unterschiede zwischen der aktuellen Offensive und der im vergangenen September? Wie lange wird die russische Verteidigung dem ukrainischen Druck standhalten können? Well, the, the big difference between now and what happened in September is the level of Russian preparation. Uh, in September, 
uh, Russia, you know, there, uh, people need to reflect that uh, words have meaning. Um, and when you speak of the special military operation, uh, we're not speaking of an invasion. We're speaking of a special military operation that had limited goals and objectives um, and, 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 and had a force um, composition that reflected that. Russia's goal going into Ukraine was not to occupy Ukraine. Russia's goal was to get Ukraine to the negotiating table. And so there were uh, the, 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 the initial military phase was designed to uh, present an overwhelming problem, military problem to the Ukrainians. One that threatened uh, the loss of territory, the potential um, loss of the capital in order to get the Ukrainians to say, we don't want to engage in this fight. We will negotiate. We will do what we should have done before this war started, implement Minsk-like accords. And it almost worked. Uh, everybody says, well, the Russian effort was a failure. Well, it almost worked. They almost got Ukraine to Istanbul to sit down and sign a peace treaty. NATO prevented it. NATO intervened. And um, NATO then promised Ukraine tens of billions of dollars worth of military assistance, both in terms of uh, providing um, weaponry, but also training. And the Russians, um, when, when Ukraine walked away from the um, negotiating table, Russia went to its second phase, which was simply to the liberation of um, the Donbass and consolidation of um, the land bridge, uh, the, the Kherson, the Zaporizhia uh, territories, um, in hopes that by continuing this struggle, Ukraine would reconsider its refusal to negotiate. Um, when Ukraine attacked in September of last year, uh, Russia was not deployed doctrinally. You can't be. Um, the, 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 the Russians did not have enough troops. And politically, it was difficult for Russia because Putin had not adequately explained the special military operation to the Russian people. It was very difficult to, to say, well, we now need to mobilize um, hundreds of thousands of men. Um, plus, the, I, I think the Russians got a little complacent and didn't um, think the Ukrainians were capable of launching a, a major counteroffensive. Um, and the Ukrainians achieved um, operational success. They, they were able to, um, with the assistance of NATO, rebuild the Ukrainian army. A lot of people don't recognize that. Between the initiation of the special military operation in June of uh, 2022, the Ukrainian army was largely destroyed by the Russians. But the NATO intervention with military assistance and training allowed Ukraine to rebuild a second army. And this army was very capable, designed for offensive operations, and they attacked Russians when the Russians weren't ready for this. The Russians didn't have adequate defenses. They hadn't prepared for this. And as a result, uh, the Ukrainians got impressive territorial successes, recapturing part cold, et cetera. Um, but that attack liberated Russia to do things that uh, previously couldn't be done, such as mobilization. 300,000 men were mobilized. Uh, it also enabled Russia to consolidate its military resources, uh, shortening their line of defense. And then what the Russians did is they built a defense that was um, per doctrine, multiple layers of defense, uh, troops uh, uh, organized uh, in strong points uh, that were designed to receive and attack artillery and air power, preparing to put overwhelming firepower on any attacking force. Um, your question of does Ukraine have a chance or how long the Russians can hold out? They can hold out forever. There's nothing Ukraine can do to defeat the Russian defenses. Russia's playing to its strength right now. You know, there was a lot of assumptions made that the Russians didn't know how to fight, wouldn't have the will to fight because they ran in September, they'll run today. The mobilized troops have poor morale, poor training. All of it has turned out to be wrong. The Russians are standing, the Russians are fighting. The people that are the heart of this struggle are the mobilized soldiers, and they're showing their professionalism and their dedication. Um, the Ukrainian forces, meanwhile, you know, the, the forces that attacked in September um, we're still operating using somewhat of Soviet doctrine. 
but that army was destroyed. The new army that's been rebuilt is a NATO army. But the problem is you can't take NATO tactics, NATO equipment uh, that takes NATO years to train their people to operate and use, and then compress it to one month and train Ukrainian soldiers for a month and say, you're ready to use NATO tactics. And then you send them into the most dense, heavily fortified, professionally constructed defenses the world has ever seen. <laughs> the outcome is guaranteed, the slaughter that is taking place today. Um, from the initiation of the, uh, uh, the counteroffensive until today, uh, anywhere from 7,500 to 9,500 Ukrainian soldiers have died. And that's on Germany. That's on NATO. That's on the West. This counteroffensive has no chance to succeed, none. All of the investment that Germany and NATO and everybody have made to this new third Ukrainian army um, will be destroyed on the field of battle. And then the problem comes, um, are you able to build a fourth Ukrainian army? Is Germany ready to provide the assistance necessary for that? And I think Germany's answered, no, we don't have it. I think NATO's answered, we don't have anything left. And so once again, by urging Ukraine to launch this counteroffensive, all you've done is guarantee the death of Ukrainians and the death of the Ukrainian nation. Gegenwärtig findet unter deutscher Führung das NATO-Manöver Air Defender 2023 statt. Das größte seiner Art seit dem Ende des Zweiten Weltkrieges. Es wäre nicht das erste Mal, dass unter dem Vorwand eines solchen Manövers auch die Weichen für eine weitere Eskalation gesetzt werden. Man denke nur an die Sea Breeze Manöver im Schwarzen Meer oder Baltops in der Ostsee. Was ist das für ein Signal, das die NATO und auch die Bundesregierung von Kanzler Scholz mit Air Defender senden wollen? Wäre die NATO überhaupt in der Lage, Europa in einem Luftkrieg gegen Russland zu verteidigen? I mean, Air Defender sounds nice um, and it, it, it looks impressive, but let's just be clear. Um, as, as we look at what Air Defender is trying to do, um, It's an exercise that almost defeats itself. Simply by deploying this many aircraft into Germany, um, you've overwhelmed Germany's logistics capability to support this. Um, half of the exercise is squandered on moving airplanes from base to this base. Just the simple process of moving airplanes to a base is an overwhelming problem for NATO. They're learning how to talk with each other. They're learning how joint operational proceedings What they're not doing is learning how to fight. Um, you know, NATO, the NATO Air Force has never gone up against an integrated air defense system of the sort that Russia has, um, both in Belarus and the Baltics or in Ukraine. Uh, all of these NATO aircraft will be shot down in the first days of any by the Russian air defense system. The Russian Air Force, uh, likewise, would decimate these forces if they ever tried to fight. Um, you know, it's interesting, a large number of these aircraft are F-35 aircraft. Uh, again, everybody talks about it as a wonder weapon, but I think the, the NATO planners who were involved in this exercise, they know some things that maybe the media is not picking up on, such as how difficult it is to maintain the F-35. What is the actual operational rate of the F-35? How often does it break down? What is the expense of flying the F-35? And when the F-35 does fly, Does it operate to its full potential or because it's an over-designed airplane that doesn't work, is it limited to doing certain things, which means that this entire air defender exercise is a sham. It's a Potemkin village of a military exercise designed to create an impression that any military expert when looking at it recognizes to be false. Um, NATO does not have the ability to go to war against Russia using air power. There's a lot of people that say, well, if only NATO air power get involved. Again, ask the German government, how many bombs do you have? And the answer is not enough. Ask any NATO air force, what is your stockpile of air-to-air -air missiles? Because if you want to get involved in an air-to-air -air fight against the Russian air force, you don't have enough. I would also ask basic questions such as, how much fuel do you have? Because there's a reason why the majority of the German Air Force uh, sits on the ground and doesn't fly. Because 
they're not maintained properly, and you just don't have the infrastructure to support that kind of air operation. How much preparation had to go into getting NATO ready just to hold this exercise? What resources had to be allocated? And once this exercise is done, do those resources exist for an actual air campaign? And the answer is no. NATO is incapable, incapable of waging large-scale aerial combat against Russia. Not just that, you can't defend your own airspace. I th hope Germans understand what happened to the Patriot systems that were sent to Ukraine. I hope the Germans understand what happened to the Iris T. That's a German system that was sent to Ukraine or the NASAMs. They were all destroyed. Russia will overwhelm European air defense because Europe doesn't have an air defense. Germany is defenseless, defenseless. If the Russians wanted to, they could flood German airspace with Kinzhal missiles, caliber missiles, drones, and Germany can't defend itself. Air defender, you can't defend anything. So it's a joke. It's part of the sham that is modern day NATO. NATO has not been preparing for this kind of fight. And so right now NATO is trying to put on the impression that it's ready, but it's not. To be ready, you have to train. Look, this is, I'll leave you with this imagery. Um, because maybe people understand it. Imagine 30 years ago, NATO being a vibrant young man, a bodybuilder, goes to the gym every day, lifts weights, flexes, and says, I'm big and I'm strong. And then for the next 30 years, that bodybuilder sat on the couch eating potato chips, bratwurst, and not going to the gym. And so now it's a 60, 70-year-old man with atrophied muscles, a pot belly, no strength. And now it wants to stand up and say, I am somebody. No, dude, if you wanted to be somebody, you needed to go to the gym. You needed to work out. Military capability is like muscle. It has to be exercised to be real. And NATO has not been exercising its military capability. It hasn't been drinking its protein shakes. It hasn't been lifting the weights. And it is a pathetic, atrophied old man right now trying to be something that he maybe once was but will never be again. Vielen Dank Scott für deine Zeit.